welcome to today's On This Day in Tudor History. I'm Claire Ridgway, I run the Amberlin Files and Tudor Society websites and I'm also the author of several books on Tudor history. Now today, as promised, I'm taking you back to 1533 and the coronation of my favourite uh, historical personality, Queen Anne Boleyn. Uh, the 1st of June 1533, oops sorry that's a dog making their way into the room. Uh, the 1st of June 1533 was Whitsunday and it was chosen to be Anne Boleyn's coronation day. Of course Anne being the second wife of King Henry VIII and she was crowned queen at Westminster Abbey in a ceremony performed by the Archbishop of Canterbury and her good friend Thomas Cranmer. Now, Henry and Anne had waited six years for this day. So this was a real day of triumph and victory for them. But it must have been such an exhausting day for Anne because she was uh, pregnant with course, the baby that would go on to be uh, Elizabeth I at this time. And she had to go through um, a long ceremony and then um, a huge coronation banquet, which we are told the primary sources tell her consisted of around 80 dishes. So rather her than me, I can remember uh, how tired I got when I was six months pregnant. So rather Anne than me. But let me tell you just a little bit more about this day in 1533. Now at seven o'clock um, in the morning, the mayor of London, the aldermen, the sheriffs and the council of the city of London took a barge to Westminster and waited there for the Queen. It is said that Anne arrived somewhere between 8 and 9 a.m. and that um, she stood under a cloth of state while the royal courts and peers um, gathered and sorted themselves out. Once everybody was ready, the officers of arms organised everyone into a procession, rather than me, because uh, I'm sure that it took a lot of organisation, a lot of moving around. Um, and this procession was to make their way on a railed blue ray cloth, which had been laid from the high uh, dais of the King's Bench in the hall at Westminster, all the way to the high altar of the Abbey, Westminster Abbey, so from Westminster Hall to Westminster Abbey. And this was a 700 yard route that they had to go along. So you had this beautiful blue sort of carpet, blue ray cloth uh, that they, these people processed over. The procession, like the uh, coronation procession the day before, was a rather long one. Chronicler Edward Hall lists it in order. He says that there were gentlemen, squires, knights, aldermen of the city, then judges, knights of the bath, barons and viscounts, earls, marquises and dukes, then the Lord Chancellor, the staff, staff of the chapel royal and monks, abbots and bishops, then the sergeants and officers of arms, the mayor of London, the Marquis of Dorset bearing the scepter of gold, the Earl of Arundel bearing the rod of ivory topped with a dove, the Earl of Oxford, High Chamberlain of England, carrying the crown of St. Edward, Charles Brandon, Duke of Suffolk and High Steward of England for the day, William Howard carrying the rod of the Marshal of England, then the Garter Knights, and then finally, Queen Anne Boleyn. And Anne was wearing ermine-trimmed purple velvet coronation robes, and on her head was a coif and gold coronet, the same coronet that she'd worn uh, the previous day for her procession through the streets of London. Anne walked barefoot to the abbey under a canopy of cloth of gold carried once again by the barons of the Cinque Ports. The Dowager Duchess of Norfolk bore the Queen's train and Anne was followed by another procession behind her, the Bishops of London and Winchester and the ladies and gentlewomen all dressed in scarlet. Now, you may be wondering where the King was in all of this. Well, the King was watching the procession entering the Abbey from behind a lattice screen in a special stand. So he wanted the focus to be on his Queen, his wife. 
This was a real statement of her status as his true wife and queen. Anne made her way to the gold draped chair of St Edward, where she was able to sit and rest for a few minutes before making her way to the high altar. There she prostrated herself, which I can't quite get my head around. It must have been rather uncomfortable in her condition to lie on her front. Um, she did that so that Archbishop Cramner could pray over her. Then she got up and the Archbishop anointed her. Then it was time for some orations. So Anne was able to rest again in St. Edward's chair before the Archbishop crowned her with the crown of St. Edward. Now, this is really important because this crown of St. Edward was not normally used for crowning uh, consorts, queen cons queen's consort, which uh, you know, is what Anne was. Anne was not the reigning monarch. She was the wife of the king. Um, and this crown was usually reserved only for crowning the reigning monarch. So this is another statement by Henry VIII. The Archbishop then placed the scepter in her right hand and the rod in her left hand. The Te Deum was sung and the Archbishop helped Anne exchange what would have been a very heavy crown for a specially custom-made lighter version. It was then time for the Mass. Anne took the sacrament and then gave the traditional offering in St Edward's Shrine. Then it was time, and that would have taken a long, long time, that service. Then it was time for everyone to get back in line to process back from the Abbey to Westminster Hall via New Palace Yard, um, where there were cisterns running with wine. It was now time after that service was over and Anne was the crowned queen. It was now time for the traditional coronation banquet. So Anne processed to the sound of trumpets with her father, Thomas Boleyn, Earl of Wiltshire on her right and Lord Talbot, who was acting on behalf of his father, the Earl of Shrewsbury on her left. At this celebratory coronation banquet, Anne sat on the king's marble chair under a cloth of state next to the Archbishop of Canterbury. Her husband, the king, did not join her, but instead again was hidden. He watched the banquet from a special little closet along with the ambassadors of France and Venice to keep him company. So again, the focus was all on Anne. Anne was attended at the banquet by the Dowager Countess of Oxford and the Countess of Worcester who stood beside her and then she had two gentlewomen at her feet so she was well attended. For the proceedings the Earl of Oxford acted as High Chamberlain holding his white staff of office um, and he was standing between the Queen and the Archbishop of Canterbury. The Earl of Essex acted as Carver the Earl of Sussex as Sewer, the Earl of Derby as Cupbearer, the Earl of Arundel as Chief Butler, and Thomas Wyatt as Chief Ewer on behalf of his father. After everyone had taken their seats, Charles Brandon, Duke of Suffolk, and William Howard entered the hall on horseback to announce the first course. I just love that they actually entered the hall on horseback. There must have been room for them to do that. It must have been such a wonderful sight. The first course was brought into the hall by the Knights of the Bath. And chronicler Edward Hall describes how the Duke of Suffolk was wearing a jacket and doublet set with orient pearl and a gown of embroidered crimson velvet and that his horse was draped with crimson velvet embroidered with real gold letters which reached the ground. Each course was announced with trumpets and heralds crying largesse. Now this banquet must have gone on for hours and hours with the fact that it is described as having around 80 dishes and then it ended with wafers and hippocrats. The Queen then washed and enjoyed a void of spice and comforts. The Mayor of London offered Anne a gold cup to drink from, which she did and then gave back to him. An exhausted Anne Boleyn was then able to retire to her, to her chambers 
but she had to, she couldn't just go straight to bed. She had to receive and thank everyone in her chambers before she could retire for the night. I can't imagine at all how tired she must have been when she finally did get into bed and whether in fact she could actually sleep after all that. My mind would have been buzzing with everything that had been going on over the last few days. So a really long coronation procession through the streets of London the previous day, a really long service of coronation on this day, followed by a huge banquet and uh, lots of you know having to look happy even though you're heavily pregnant and might not be enjoying yourself but I'd, I'd just love to go back in time to 1533 and see these these days of triumph and victory for Queen Anne and it's just so very sad that you know three years later Anne was actually dead by this time in that year so so very sad Anyway, I hope you're enjoying these On This Day in Tudor History videos. Uh, if you are, then do give, uh, do give these videos a like. You can subscribe to the channel by clicking around about there and you can hit the bell to be notified as new videos go live. But I will be back tomorrow with another On This Day in Tudor History event for you. Take care. Bye bye.